Who do you think is the most extraordinary scientific mind that we've, you know, that, that humanity has produced? There is no contest. Isaac Newton. No, I, nothing, nobody comes close. Explain why. Um, I, okay, so, uh, okay. Uh, he, working alone, discovers the laws of motion. Then he discovers the law of gravity, universal law of gravitation. Oh, and then someone asks, uh, uh, Ike, or I don't know what they call him, Ike, uh, <laughs> why do your planets orbit in this shape, ellipses, the ovals, rather than perfect circle? They say, I don't know, I, I'll get back to you. And he goes home. And he comes back, I finally have my answer. And they say, well, Isaac, how did you do that? Well, I had to invent integral and differential calculus to answer that question. <laughs> he then discovers the laws of optics, deducing that white light is composed of colors. Because you could take those same colors, recombine them, and get white light, which freaked out artists of the day. So he does all of this. Then he turns 26. <laughs> you tell me. What, okay? And in one of his books called Optics, he has a section in the back called Queries. I love that. And in my podcast, we have a, a, a variant of the podcast called Cosmic Queries. And I'm inspired by Isaac Newton in this regard. Uh, it's just called queries. And this is, these are questions just spilled at, off his plate. Crumbs that he, he didn't have time to answer. He never got around to it. Just some questions. Let me just tack them onto the back of the book. One of them is, I wonder if the stars of the night sky are just like our sun, but just much, much farther away. Hmm. I'm saying when you see someone, because great scientists are marked not by their answers, but by how great their questions are. Because not all questions are made equal. Here's a question. At what temperature does the number seven melt? That's a completely meaningless question. <laughs> Even though the nouns and verbs are in the right order and it has a question mark. Imagine how many people have asked those kinds of questions before and spent their whole life trying to answer them. We haven't heard of any of them because they were barking up the wrong tree. Because unlike in the arts, where your creativity can be put to page, and let's take Van Gogh's Starry Night, for example. If Van Gogh didn't paint that, no one ever for the rest of the history of the world will ever paint that. If Beethoven didn't write his Ninth Symphony, no one else is ever going to write it. They're unique expressions of unique individual creativity. Okay. Whereas in science, it's nature that's the ultimate judge, jury, and executioner of an idea. So Newton was brilliant and he did all that alone before he was 26. Somebody would have come up with the same thing if, or some combination of people. So, it, so the, the rules are a little different in, in this regard. So another question that would make no sense is, what kind of cheese is the moon made out of? <laughs> let's, let's, let's assume that was your big question. You would design experiments to, to fly to the moon to check, is it camembert? Is it blue cheese? And you're just wasting everybody's time, but you don't know it at the time. His questions, we, I'm looking at it 200 years in the future of those questions. I say, this man is on every single question. And he has this astonishing quote. I will mangle it only a little bit. He says, sometimes I feel as a child on the ocean shore picking up one pebble over another because it's shinier. Yet the great ocean of undiscovered truths lay before me. That's Isaac Newton. 
humbled by what he knew he didn't yet know, yet what he figured out transformed us all. And I got in big trouble one time. This 12 years ago, something like this. Okay. December 25th, I tweet. On this day, long ago, a child was born who by the age of 30 would transform civilization. <laughs> Happy birthday, Isaac Newton. <laughs> born 1642. <laughs> Boy, that pissed off a lot of people. Christians, it would have pissed off, not the Jews, of course. Um, Isaac Newton was born Christmas Day, 1642. But there's a technicality. Remember, that's England, and England was the Anglican Church, and they didn't care what the Pope said. By then, the Pope had invoked the Gregorian calendar, which happened like 50, 100 years earlier. I don't, 50 years earlier. So England was not going to take the Pope's calendar just because the Pope said so. And, but that calendar is way more accurate and corrected the locations of the dates. And so on the Gregorian calendar, he's born Jan today, uh, January 4th, yesterday, in 1643. So, but I slipped it in with a, with a, with a Julian calendar bit. <laughs> But it, it pissed off some people. And it's odd because Isaac Newton was actually born, you know, on that calendar, he was actually born on that date. When no one knows what day Jesus was born, right? So people are angry with me for saying something true. <laughs> it's tough out there, let me tell you. I don't know. <laughs> the cesspool of social media. Yeah. In the next 50 or 70 uh, five years, do you think it is conceivable that we will be able to establish enough self-sustaining colonies on Mars to make it a worthwhile expenditure of massive amounts of money to explore that possibility? In 1969, when we landed on the moon, there were all these articles that came out. Old timers will remember Life magazine, Look magazine, talking about the future. They said, we're on the moon in 1969, will have colonies on Mars by 1985. You realize we have not left low Earth orbit since 1972, 52 years ago. And you're asking me in 50 years whether we're gonna have colonies on Mars? You're asking that because it looks like that's just the next thing to happen. However, that's not why we ever went anywhere in space. We went into space because we felt threatened by the godless communists. And we were reacting to everything they did in space. They put up Sputnik. We freaked out. We founded NASA. They put up a dog. We put up a chimp. We put up a thing. And this kept going. And then we got to the moon. We looked over our shoulder. Wait, where are the Ruskins? The Rus oh, they're not here. Okay. Then we ended the space program. We had Apollo 18 ready to fly. We never flew it. Because the Russians said, we ain't following you to the moon. Y'all, it's crazy, okay? <laughs> so, but we're going back to the moon now. Project Artemis. Artemis, NASA was early woke here. Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo in Greek legend. That, that's pretty early woke for NASA. And NASA's going back to the moon? Well, why are they going now? Why did they stay on the moon in 1972 or go back in 1980 or 1990 or 2000 or 2010? Why? Oh! China says they want to put astronauts on the moon. And all of a sudden, hey, wouldn't it be good if we went back to the moon? Yeah, <laughs> sure, let's do that. And, that can, and Trump announces this, and it smoothly goes into the Biden administration, and it's going to continue back. And that's something that transcends all politics, because we are spooked by other folks who might get to some place before us. And plant a flag. And by the way, you know what? You didn't ask this, but I would tell you. All our flags are either down or faded beyond recognition on the moon. China is making a flag with threads made from the rock called basalt. They're making threads out of rock. <laughs> so that when they deploy their flag, 
it will be good for a billion years, as long as the rocks are good. So. And it'll cost $5. <laughs>